Well, I think I'll start by talking about New York City. I came to the city in 1973 uh, under the kind wing of Columbia University. I was very naive. I don't think I ever saw a real artist. I was already 33. I um, spent two years there at Columbia University getting a, a Master's of Fine Arts, and it was a way of existing in the city uh, for someone who had been exposed actually to relatively um, few things that have to do with travel, that have to do with a kind of um, worldly know-how, so that it was, it was just a kind way of introducing myself to, to the city. Uh, I found a real artist. I found many real artists who would come and lecture uh, at, at Columbia University. Uh, one of them was Philip Guston, and I recall there being about seven of us students that listened to him speak to us in a small classroom. And there's a way in which one can speak to students in that there isn't really much to gain or much to lose, uh, that, uh, that there is an empathy that the speaker has toward what these students might need, or maybe even an identification with these students in that they're pursuing the same thing that you're pursuing. I mean, they're groping like the artist is groping. And that was one of the main points of Philip Guston's talk in that he was at a time when he was making that uh, transition into a world that felt so um, unknown and in a sense scary to him and it was the world of course where he turned to these these characters that were psychologically so um, you know depicted in that it gave you a real taste of what his life was like and it's not so much his life but how his brain brewed and what his brain thought about uh, and he was essentially indicating, you know, all of the doubts that he had about where he was going. Um, and certainly at that time, the, the critics were down on him because he was changing from these jewel-like expressionistic, you know, um, sort of coral-colored paintings that were a lot about how paint gets applied to to making almost like a 380 degree turnaround to a place that was much more um, much much less elegant, much less um, showy in terms of what paint can do and of course in another sense much more showy and much more having much more wisdom than what he was doing with the paint before, which had greater limitations, but it was that which was acceptable, much more acceptable at the time. Anyway, just to see, just to hear a painter who was able to surface with this kind of vulnerability was extremely uh, important. Um, and in knowing that someone like Philip Guston gropes, made the groping, you know, made my groping um, something that was okay to do. So that was, that was just one of the things that occurred at Columbia University. But of course, there was the entire, and, and I, I went to a, a many lectures. I, I, I went to Meyer Shapiro, I listened to him speak about medieval ages as though it were so relevant, not only relevant to what happens historically, <clears throat> but relevant to 
um, how we think today, what the artists are doing today, and it isn't even sort of an evolutionary process that he would describe, but uh, a relationship that is almost like that of nature to us, nature to who and what we are, nature to what we, uh, with the imagery that we choose to work with, nature in connection to how we think, um, so that he, it wasn't even nature that he spoke about so much, but he was able to make relationships that had universal uh, implications and applications. And also there was a whole slew of contemporary artists that would sit in on the class because he was such a great thinker. And at that time, <coughs> he was old, his fingers were full of arthritis, he had a pair of hand-knit gray mittens on, and he would, you know, wave his hands around as he spoke with so much emotion and, 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 and such commitment that um, it, it, you know, the content of what he said didn't need to have more credibility, but indeed those waving hands for me uh, because of the visual implications, gave those words more credibility. So that was mainly Columbia University, but New York City was something that just, you know, and I could take my time because it was almost overwhelming. So I would take little bites out of different museums. I would take little bites out of different artists that I would have crushes on, you know, like, like a de Kooning was one of them, Giotto was uh, for a long time, uh, and many other artists. And, you know, I would, the first thing I would do is, is I would get a lot of books from the library and just surround myself with their images. But I would also see if I could seek them out, uh, as in the case of Giotto, I visited, this was again early on, this must have been 76, 77, I visited every cathedral and almost every place that Giotto had his frescoes, that he had his images, that he had, that, that uh, even, well, the paintings as well, as many as I could with the paintings. Um, anyway, New York City was some, was a place that woke me up in a way that I needed to be woken up. Its rawness, its harshness, the, the geometry of the surfaces of the buildings, the hardness of those surfaces, the heartlessness of those surfaces, in a way made me want to react to it. And and, and make something that was the opposite of that, that make a surface that was more soulful, make a surface that was more uh, comforting is not the right word, but emotional, I guess, that was anxiety provoking in a very different way than those, um, than the surfaces of the, of the city, which felt very inhumane. And I guess things like the West Side Highway at those times, this was the early 70s, this was maybe later on in the 70s, that I used to run all the time, and the height of that highway seemed uh, kind of magnificent, and the crustiness of that road falling apart and disintegrating also looked great in that it didn't have that insistent, hard-edged, that insistent, linear thing, measured, engineered thing that all of Manhattan has. Um, and I lived on Spring Street and 6th Avenue. I had a loft there where I worked up until 1981. And because I uh, made so much noise, and, and, and in fact, this was an artist in residence building, but it wasn't long before there was no one else who was an artist, that I was the only one. And of course, I made noise with my table saws, with my circular saws, and I 
created smells with my resource and all glue and so on. So uh, I knew that I needed to leave, so at 81 I did. I got myself a studio for, that I had for 24 years in Williamsburg, which is Brooklyn, seven blocks into Brooklyn after one crosses the Williamsburg Bridge. And then 10 years ago, I moved to a place where I am right now, where your video, this video takes place. And that is uh, on Ingraham Street in a place called Bushwick, which is East Williamsburg. So I moved about 30 blocks further east. And in looking for this building, I must have looked at 127 different buildings uh, because I knew I couldn't move again. For me to move is a huge, daunting deal. Uh, so I'm hoping that I can stay here forever in terms of my life uh, span. But uh, I see that in the 10 years that I've been here, for the first few years, uh, as uh, I have roll-up doors, we, I would look in the springtime or the summer, the roll-up door would be open, and I would see immigrants walking to sweatshops. Now it's almost all, I'd say 95% of the people that walk by that roll-up door are artists. So it's a neighborhood that's changing. And of course, when artists come, so do a lot of other really good things, you know, like restaurants and bars and theaters, and, and then come the, uh, the wealthy ones that are trouble for me. So, uh, but I intend to stay here.